If you've been watching my channel for a while, you'll know that I did a couple of videos on the Westland Whirlwind, an interesting aircraft that, though it provided good service as a ground pounder, never met its potential as a fighter. Much of this is attributable to problems with the Whirlwind's power plant, propellers and cooling system, and these, plus some other issues which I talk about in my other videos, curtailed the Whirlwind's combat career. But there has always been this persistent theme in Arrowhead discussion circles about a bit of a what-if situation. Had Westland fitted the famed Rolls-Royce Merlins to the whirlwind, what might it have achieved? Well, here's the thing. They did. Kind of. Say hello to the Westland Welkin. This was effectively a next stage evolution of the whirlwind, though with a very specific role in mind because though the Whirlwind would eventually make itself useful as a ground attack aircraft, the Welkin was all about altitude. Indeed, the name Welkin comes from an old English word that means cloud or firmament, and the aircraft was developed to deal with a very specific threat. In August 1940, the Luftwaffe began utilising Junkers Ju-86P high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft over the British Isles. This aircraft, with its pressurised cabin, enlarged wingspan, and UMO 207 diesel engines, was capable of flying at 39,000 feet, which was beyond the interception capabilities of any British fighter flying at the time. From such high altitudes, the JU-86P could conduct photo reconnaissance of British defences, and, on occasion, drop the odd bomb or two, though not with any great accuracy but the threat was enough to goad the Royal Air Force into seeking a solution. Having German aircraft flying with impunity was obviously an operational nightmare, and there was also the concern that the Germans might begin to field fleets of high-altitude bombers that would be immune from interception completely. Instructions were therefore issued for the development of a high-altitude interceptor that would be able to engage the threat. Indeed, there had been proposals for such an aircraft even before the war began and as a result, two aircraft were put forward for the RAF specification, the Westland P-14 and the Vickers Type 432. The latter, which was nicknamed the Tin Mosquito because it did indeed have a resemblance to the de Havilland aircraft of that name, was a very interesting aircraft, but ultimately had issues that led it to not being selected. With the P-14, subsequently named the Welkin, by contrast, Westland seems to have been able to learn from the lessons and mistakes of the Whirlwind's development. Indeed, the aircraft shared the same designer, Teddy Petter, and no doubt he was able to draw on his recent experiences with the Whirlwind, hence the family resemblance. But though it's easy to see the Welkin as an enhanced version of the Whirlwind, it was a unique aircraft, being a tremendously complex project for its day. For starters, instead of the troublesome peregrines of the Whirlwind, the Welkin did indeed use Rolls-Royce Merlins, though advanced versions fitted with two-stage superchargers that would allow the aircraft to operate at extreme altitudes. The P-14 was ordered in January 1941, and would fly for the first time in November 1942. This was equipped with Merlin 61s, the same as would be fitted to the Supermarine Spitfire Mark IX, and the subsequent production Welkins would be fitted with Merlin 76 and 77s, which rotated in opposite directions from each other, and so countered engine torque. The Welkin also had an extremely strong cockpit construction to allow for pressurisation, including a double-skin perspex canopy that had warm air blown between the layers to prevent freezing over. The pressurisation was however not perfect, and cabin altitude was set at 24,000 feet. This in turn meant that the pilot needed to wear an oxygen mask despite pressurisation and a high-altitude survival suit if he had to bail out. Another notable change from the Whirlwind was the altered armament layout. Though the Welkin retained the four 20mm Hispano cannon of its predecessor, these were moved from the nose to a belly tray under the aircraft. This had the advantage of enabling the aircraft to carry more ammunition, be serviced more easily, and allowed the pilot's position to be moved further forward than in the Whirlwind, improving visibility. But the most notable visual difference between the Whirlwind and the Welkin was the size difference, because the Welkin was absolutely massive. 
the Whirlwind had a wingspan of 45 feet. The Welkins was 70 feet. That's only a foot shorter than the wingspan of a B-26 bomber. Of course, the Welkin needed those massive wings to maintain stability at the high altitudes it was intended to fly at, with the aircraft having a sighted service ceiling of 44,000 feet. Testing showed that the aircraft had pretty good performance, not just hitting the required altitudes, but also making a top speed of 385 miles per hour. However, the long wings did mean it wasn't a particularly agile aircraft, with a slow roll rate. Hardly a surprise, as the Welkin was not designed to be a dogfighter after all. But the wings would throw up an unforeseen problem. To make sure they were strong enough to support themselves, the wings were made with a high thickness to cooled ratio. So that is the thickness of the wings against their length. And this led to a problem that was then becoming more and more prevalent in aircraft. Compressibility stalls in a dive. Once the Welkin hit around 500 miles per hour, the aircraft started to vibrate severely. Indeed, Westland's test pilot, Harold Penrose, stated that in its milder forms at the start of compression, the aircraft acted like, quote, tobogganing down a flight of stairs on a tea tray. So I dread to think what the Welkin must have been like when it experienced serious compressibility issues. Penrose also encountered another issue which proved an unexpected hazard. In early testing, the pressurization system heated the cockpit up tremendously, causing Penrose to sweat profusely. He then contracted pneumonia during the Welkin's testing program, which he asserted was because of getting out of the boiling hot aircraft into a freezing cold wind after landing. Certainly his accusation was taken seriously enough that the whole pressurization system was reworked to run at a much cooler level. And once he had recovered and resumed working on the Welkin program, Penrose reported it was now a very comfortable aircraft to fly indeed. But the compressibility issue would never be resolved, and it was soon recognised as being intrinsic to the design and something that pilots would just have to deal with. And so it was that the Welkin was ordered into production and officially entered into service with the RAF in May 1944. Which is somewhat strange, because by then it was basically completely redundant. As said, the Welkin prototype first flew in November 1942, but in August 1942, Junkers Ju-86Rs began nuisance bombing raids over southern England. Although only dropping single bombs on occasional targets as they trawled slowly overhead, this was enough to put the air ministry into a frenzy, and they ordered a solution to be found as quick as possible. The first step was the building of the de Havilland Mosquito Mark 15, which was a rapid conversion of this ever-adaptable aircraft that allowed it to go up to altitudes above 40,000 feet. And it shows how important this was considered because the first Mosquito Mark 15 prototype flew only about three weeks after the Junkers made their first raid, and the type was in service by early February 1943. But in fact, even this turned out to be irrelevant because on September the 12th, 1942, a specially modified Spitfire Mark 9 managed to intercept a Ju-86 and commenced a running fight with it all the way up to 44,000 feet. The Spitfire didn't manage to destroy the Junkers, but that was probably for the best because the Germans realised that their high altitude tactic had already been countered and, with only a literal handful of the specially converted Ju-86 ever made, decided to never risk them again over the British Isles. So, as said, when the Welkin entered service, it was kind of surplus. Indeed, to say it entered service at all is open to interpretation, as though the aircraft was officially on the books of the Royal Air Force, only two ever flew in service, and that to conduct specialist testing in high-altitude tactics. A second model, the Welkin Mark II, was also developed, which was a two-seat radar-equipped night interceptor, but this ultimately was limited to the single prototype that was built. All told, 77 flyable Welkins were built, made up of the P-14 and the Mark II, and 75 production Mark Is. Another 26 aircraft were constructed, which never received engines, and all of these aircraft would go to the scrapyard fairly quickly, with the type being officially retired from British service in November 1944, a mere six months or so after entering it. So the Western Welkin is a bit of an oddity. 
It was an extremely advanced and challenging technical project that actually came together remarkably trouble-free considering. With the issues that the aircraft encountered pretty much par for the course in developing technologies that pushed the very boundaries of what was known in aeronautics at the time. It also seems to have been capable of performing its extremely specialist role satisfactorily, but by the point it was available to do that mission, it wasn't really needed, because other aircraft already in production could manage it, even if they needed modifications to do so. But despite all that, the Welkin still got a limited production run and service life. One suspects it was allowed to continue development and enter production because the British authorities didn't want to get caught out by the sudden appearance again of more super high flying bombers as had occurred in 1942. After all, if the Germans had pushed even higher, maybe a botched together Mosquito or Spitfire wouldn't be able to do the job anymore and the specialist Welkin would be needed. Regardless, by late 1944, the Air Ministry and the Royal Air Force were evidently confident that the threat had passed, and so had the need for the Welkin. However, it wasn't all a wasted effort. Just as Teddy Petter seems to have learnt from the whirlwind in his developing of the Welkin, so too his experiences with the Welkin helped him develop his next aircraft, the English Electric Canberra. This notably had a much better wing thickness to cord ratio and subsequently would prove an excellent aircraft that saw widespread service with multiple users all over the world. So although the Welkin may not be as well remembered as either its whirlwind forebear or Canberra descendant, nor saw anything like their service, it still played an important part in post-war aviation development. <laughs>